Dr. Kira. It's really wonderful to have you talk to us, parents circle. Uh, and you have such vast experience in the field of uh, counseling, both parents and families and children. And uh, I look forward to hearing a lot about the, some effective, positive parenting practices that are rooted in what you call conscious parenting. So yes. I'm looking forward to the conversation with you today, Kira. And before we get started, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and let us know uh, what you've been doing all these 22 years. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I am a licensed clinical social worker, which means that um, my degree was in social work. I started out working with foster children in the group home setting and then went on to become a licensed therapist so that I could do private practice and do the clinical work as well. And I've had a private practice um, for the last, I think, 12 years now, since I got pregnant with my daughter, I went into that field mm -hmm. and I worked in university settings, the school setting, um, and as well as my private practice. And uh, where I'm at now is with a huge focus on positive parenting and emotional regulation, especially um, targeting the, the parents and helping them with their own emotional regulation. And that really was born as a result of my own struggle with postpartum depression and anxiety that became very severe and dangerous after um, my two little ones were born. They're now 10 and 11, but they were 15 months apart. And I just had a really, really difficult time. Um, and through my journey of healing, I started working with parents to help them implement parenting, positive parenting skills. But I realized that they were really struggling to do that because their own emotional dysregulation or their struggles with staying calm in those moments in order to be able to help their kids or implement those parenting skills it made it really difficult because they weren't able to stay calm and i that really resonated with me because that was my major struggle um, in the younger years with my own postpartum depression and anxiety and so now i started a corporation or a company called relationship cubed and cubed is you know like in math with the three it focuses on the emotionally healthy individual the families and the community because in order to have those healthy families and communities, we really need to start with having a healthy us. And that's the emotional regulation piece. And um, I recently developed and started a program called Evolving Mothers, which is focused on helping moms create self-awareness and, and um, emotional regulation skills and connecting that with the positive parenting piece so they can see how intertwined they are and giving them the skills to stay regulated in those moments. You know, with all your 22 years of practice working with parents and children and families, and you've seen so many issues, right? From, right from the, uh, you know, uh, the relationships children have with their families to their behavioral issues and, you know, maybe even addiction and, you know, all kinds of problems you probably have see encountered in your years of practice. I'm wondering how much of those, uh, what you see in children and the trauma and the issues that children face, the behaviors that children, uh, uh, you see that children exhibit, how much of that would you relate to some aspect of the parenting or their relationships with having a secure environment in their home? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I would say it's incredibly significant because as the parents, we are, um, I've heard this term used before um, just recently, and we're, it's called the uh, master co-regulators, mm -hmm. right? There's that term of co-regulation where when our kids are having a hard time managing their emotions, 
they actually need us to step in as the calm presence in order for their brains to be able to get regulated again. Their brains use the energy from our brains to uh, get back to a regulated place. And in order to be the co-regulators, we have to be able to stay calm. So when the kids are fighting and they're yelling at each other, we don't want to come in and add more fuel to the fire, like knock it off. What are you doing? Go to your rooms because that's just making them more uh, dysregulated. But instead, we want to come in as that calm presence and say, OK, you know, our voice is calm. I can see you guys are having a really hard time getting along. OK, just look at me, everybody. Just take a minute. Let's come over here. You go this way and you go this way. And we're just going to take a minute until everyone is a little bit calmer and then we are being water to that fire right we're we're calming it so we are the co-regulator in that situation and as the parent in the household we are the master co-regulator so our mood and our our emotions and our um you know the way that we're moving about the house are we being tense and angry and loud or are we making sure that we are in a place of peace and calm and presence because that impacts the mood of the kids so we are the master co-regulators of the house we whether we like it or not and that's hard to hear because sometimes you're just in a bad mood right and that's okay everyone has bad moods now and then but overall we want to recognize that our mood and our energy really has an impact on how our kids are behaving because they are feeding off of our energy. Their little brains are still developing. We're the adults with fully developed brains. They're the kids with developing brains and they need our fully developed brains to help them get to the place where they can then regulate themselves just like in the example where I regulated myself by noticing that I needed to and doing something about it to get back to that. Today, there's a lot about connecting with kids and the importance of building a strong connection with your child, right? The famous quote uh, that says, connect before you correct. Yes. So if you, uh, so there's so much focus on that. And uh, do you think that is, one of the is a key to effective parenting in your mind. Do you think that's uh, that was the key to effective parenting? Building that. Yes. Connection? Yes, I absolutely believe that. And one of the things that can help us understand why that's so important is by understanding what goes on in the brain when we connect with somebody versus when we just try to correct them first, right? So um, are your listeners typically familiar with the fight or flight? So, and I'll use Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain to help with that as well. But we, um, we have the emotional part of our brain and the lower part of the brain, it's the, like the amygdala. And then we have the more advanced thinking part of the brain. And we want to have both of those online at all times because that's when we're regulated. But when something triggers us, maybe that is our child um, throwing a toy at their sibling or not listening to us when we've asked them multiple times or getting sassy with us using a, a tone of voice that we don't like, then that sends our brain into um, some degree of fight or flight. And what that means is that lower part of the brain, which in the hand model of the brain is this lower downstairs part of the brain. And this is that amygdala where the emotions live. This is that more developed part of the brain, which is the prefrontal cortex. This is what it looks like when it's balanced. But when your child gets sassy with you or does something that that triggers you, it causes the developed part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, to go offline. All of the blood rushes away from that part of the brain into the muscles. The emotional part of the brain sends um, cortisol, the stress hormone, and uh, adrenaline into your body. So you're pumped full with all this energy and the blood to the muscles, and you're ready for this fight situation, right? 
or to flee, fight or flight. So get ready to tackle the, the threat or run from it. And we can't control what our brain determines is a trigger. Sometimes they happen in the most odd situations and you're like, why did that even upset me or bother me? But the reality is we don't necessarily need to know why all of the time. We just need to recognize when that is happening to us. So when we get flooded with that anger or the emotions rise up and we feel like we want to yell at our kids or say, knock it off, then we are in that fight or flight scenario where the, we are using half a brain, literally half a brain, and it's the survival part. It doesn't care about relationship with your child. It just cares about survival. And that's just our biology. That's our physiology. That's how we work. And we need to recognize that so that we can catch ourselves when we go into that place where we're ready to attack. So going back to your question of, is it important to connect before correct? Yes, because if I go at my child with, what are you doing? Or, you know what, you need, no, you need to do this instead. You can see on my face even, right? I'm not in a relationship oriented stance. My, my tone is angry. My face is looking angry. My words are harsh. And so what does that do to their little brain? Their little brain is like, ah, there's a threat. There's something scary. And so that blood rushes from their brain and goes into their muscles and the cortisol and the adrenaline, it pumps through their bodies and their ability to, to relate to you or absorb what you're saying is not available. That ability to hear what someone's saying and process what they're saying and agree with them and say, oh yes, mom, I see what you're saying. I'll do better next time. All of that part of the brain, it's offline, right? And they're just in survival mode. So if I come at them with like, what are you doing? Their little brain goes like this and now they just are trying to protect themselves. And so even if I, you know, tried to force them to hear what I'm saying, their brains cannot absorb what I'm saying. It is not possible. It's completely offline. So if I come at them with connection first and say, hey, you know, I see that you are really wanting to play with that doll and your sister's playing with it. Instead of taking it from her, do you think there's something else we could do? Do you think that maybe we could say, hey, sister, can I have a turn when you're done? And maybe you can play with this doll in the meantime or something like that. So I've connected because I have a calm demeanor and I've empathized with them and said, hey, I can see that you really want this. And I might even say, oh, that's really hard when you want to play with something that someone else is playing with. Right. I've connected with them. I've engaged what we call the social engagement system, which is also in this part of the brain. It's it's what we use to connect that eye contact, that soft tone of voice, that turning toward the person, leaning in and getting close um, that creates that connection. And so now I'm coming at them with their brain completely regulated, right? Now they can actually hear what I'm saying because they feel safe. Whereas if I, if I try to correct them first and say, don't take that from your sister, give that back. She was playing with that. Again, my tone of voice, my face, the way I'm coming at them, that is threatening to our systems. And so they're gonna respond to me from an emotional, uh, from a safety place, a place of needing safety is what I'm trying to say. And they're gonna get defensive and be like, well, I was playing with it first. So now we have two dysregulated brains trying to battle each other and nothing gets resolved. So when we get ourselves calm first and we connect with them by getting down to their level or, or empathizing with them by telling them what we see, hey, it looks like you're having a really hard time. Are you okay? Do you need something? Do you need a hug? Or, um, oh man, I see that you're trying so hard to put that Lego set together and the pieces just keep falling apart. That is so frustrating. Then they feel understood, they feel seen, they feel connected and they can receive 
your guidance or your suggestions, or they can go into problem solving with you. And that's what we want. All right, I want to share with you what process that we have evolved uh, to support it on how parents can respond, think and respond rather than react to a situation, just like you explained. We just call it the peace process. Ooh. And it's the acronym is PAUSE. P is for pause, where we, uh, you know, the first you regulate yourself, right? And the next E is empathize, you know, acknowledge and empathize with your child to so help the child calm down. Then A is a wait, wait for your child to calm down. Uh, the next step is what we call C. C is then you communicate and start chatting about what happened once both of you are in a regulated state. And the, la the E is for engage to find a solution. So you first do the PEA and then you do the C and E. So, the, so this is an acronym that we have come up with to, uh, to kind of uh, you know, describe exactly what you've been explaining so beautifully to us. I've heard you talk about the three-step process of shifting where you, how, on how you can regulate yourself. Uh, I've uh, listened to a post podcast where you talked about that, the three-step process of regulating yourself. Is there, uh, could you take us through those three steps? Well, I think that um, the ability to pause effectively, it starts with um, understanding ourselves better because in that moment when when you're triggered and the emotions are rising up that ability to pause right there is the biggest struggle for parents right and we can't expect ourselves to be able to do that if we haven't done some work ahead of time it would be like telling you um, okay, I know you have only learned how to do addition and subtraction in math class, but now I want you to take calculus or trigonometry, right? I want you to take a test on these things. It's really difficult because they haven't done the work to learn those things. So with us, what that looks like to understand ourselves is to um, pay attention to those moments that do cause you to get really upset and take some time to get curious about them. Um, so, well, I want to back up even one step. I, I want to encourage everyone to give yourself permission to let this be a journey, right? You're not going to listen to podcasts and read books and then all of a sudden be able to just be calm in the moment. It's a journey. And so when when you mess up, that's OK. That's part of it. Please don't get down on yourselves in those moments when you do mess up. That's the that's the best time to learn. After you've calmed down, you go back and you say, OK, what was happening in that moment? Uh, my children were fighting over the, you know, the Legos. OK. Okay, so that was a situation and what was I seeing and what was I hearing I was seeing them, you know, pushing each other, I was hearing them say mean things to each other, I was hearing their yelling voices and it was super loud. And then what was I feeling I was feeling anxious I was feeling overwhelmed I was feeling scared I was feeling fearful that they were going to hurt each other. Oh, okay. So um, in situations when I feel afraid or situations when I hear yelling or insults, that brings up fear in me. <clears throat> and so what can I do in those moments the next time my kids are yelling and, um, you know, pushing each other? What can I do to remind myself that I am safe, that I'm okay? Because our brain in that moment, it thinks that you're unsafe and that's what causes the survival brain to, to kick into action. And so what you could do is say, okay, I know I want to stay calm in those moments when they're not calm. Um, so when I hear yelling and when I see pushing, I can tell myself I am safe and I can help them in this moment, right? I can bring calm to this chaos. 
So I've created awareness about what's difficult for me, the yelling and the pushing and the harsh words. And I've created clarity. I think this is the three thing that you're the three step process you're talking about. I've created clarity about how I want to respond in that situation next time. I want the next time that I hear the yelling and see the pushing and feel scared. I want to remind myself that I'm okay and I can bring calm to this chaos. I can bring water to this fire, not fuel. Okay, so what are the tools that will help me to stay calm, to be able to help them when I feel worried and scared, when I see um, pushing and hear yelling? The tools that I can use are um, mantras like, I can bring calm to this chaos or my children are struggling and they need my help. And that activates this thinking part of the brain and helps to soothe and calm this this survival part of the brain, right? Because when when I'm scared in that moment, then my brain's going into survival mode. So I have to take care of my brain first by activating the the calming part using those mantras like um, I can bring calm to the chaos or I can bring water to this fire. My children are struggling and need my help. And then I can also do some some breathing or maybe some movement. So I was feeling a little anxious before this call. And so I checked in with my body and I allowed my body to do some movement. And for me, one of the really calming things is I stand up on my feet and I kind of rock back and forth for a little bit. And then I just let my body settle and it actually kind of resets my level of anxiety, which is understandable because what do we do when we're holding a baby? We rock and we sway. It's a comforting thing. And the same thing is for us, even as adults, it's comforting for us. So the tools that I would use to help me stay calm and stay regulated and take care of my brain when the kids are fighting and yelling and pushing, I can um, say those mantras I can take some deep breaths and maybe even put my hands on my head and my heart, because this is also a, uh, this sends the message of safety and comfort to your body and take some breaths. And then I might allow myself to sway a little bit and rock. Okay, now I'm taken care of, my body is calm. Now I have a fully, um, you know, my brain is, is fully engaged, all parts of it. And now I can go in and do the other steps in the peace process, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the that awareness has to come from learning about the situations that trigger you and cause the emotions to come up and getting clarity about what to do, what will or what you need in those moments, and then coming up with some tools to help you get there. So awareness, clarity, and tools. You know, yes, and there will be obviously moments when whatever you do, you're going to lose it, right? And then yes. a lot of times after that, we begin to feel shame, guilt, because your intentions are to be positive and wonderful, but we are after all humans. And uh, there will be moments when, um, you know, a, 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 many moments when we kind of lose it in spite of everything. So. How can we handle that guilt and that shame in that moment? That uh... mm -hmm. yes, um, absolutely. And, and we are just like our kids are learning and growing to be effective little humans, right? To be a, effective adults eventually. We are learning and growing and figuring out how to be effective parents. And just like we give them grace and compassion when they mess up and make mistakes and then we teach them and we help them learn the right way to do things they need to see us doing that for ourselves because if we want our kids to be kind to themselves when they make mistakes the best way for them to learn to do that is by seeing us be kind to ourselves when we make mistakes so you know what do you do when you make a mistake you acknowledge it you apologize and you ask for forgiveness, right? So I 
my I first have to get regulated myself if I yelled at my kids and then afterward I'm like oh my gosh I yelled again and I told myself I wasn't going to yell and I did it like, what kind of mom am I I'm going to ruin these kids whoa hold up time out right that's when you do the time out and you catch those thoughts and say this is not helpful and this is this is not how I want to treat myself okay and I acknowledge that it feels awful and I am sad that I acted that way and I can make it right. I can do something to redeem myself in that situation. So it first starts with practicing compassion toward ourselves and saying, Whew, yeah, I really feel I really feel disappointed and sad and, and terrible that I yelled and I know this is a normal thing as I'm growing and learning as a parent, I'm going to make mistakes and I choose to forgive myself right now. And so that takes care of us first, right? That nurtures us first and puts us in a regulated state of mind. And maybe that'll take five minutes. Maybe that'll take five hours. Maybe that'll take until the next day. Sometimes it takes a while to get through those feelings of shame and guilt. We just keep refocusing on the on the truth that it's okay to make mistakes and we can make them right, right? We can't change what we did, but we can choose what we do. And what we do is we make our mistakes right as best we can. So after you get to that place of, of regulation, after you've offered yourself compassion and kindness, just like you would with a friend who's struggling, you would offer them compassion and kindness. You wanna do the same for yourself. And then you go and you make it right with your kids and you say, you know what? I really messed up. I, um, I don't like yelling at you and, and I did and I did not handle my anger and my frustration in a helpful way. And I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. I'm working so hard to handle my own emotions more effectively, but I messed up that time. And I'm asking you to please forgive me and um, know that I'm trying really hard to do better. Will you forgive me? And what are they gonna say, right? Kids are so beautiful and so loving and so forgiving. And who could say no to that, right? We don't because as humans, we want that connection. And so you are repairing that relationship that was ruptured, right? You yelled at them and it created disconnect in the relationship. And then you're going back and you're repairing that relationship by acknowledging your mistake and, ask, and apologizing and asking for forgiveness. And what a beautiful thing that you're modeling for your kids, because isn't that what we want them to do when they make a mistake? When they do something that we don't like and we bring it to their attention, we don't want them to just ignore us and walk away. We want them to acknowledge it and apologize. And so when we model that for them, we're giving them the tools to know how to do that, to know what that looks like. We've been talking a lot about connect to correct till now. I know I'd like to, you know, to also understand that before we get to that stage when we have to correct, you know, how, how can we build that positive, uh, uh, the connection with our children on a regular basis, a positive connection with our children? How important is that, you know, just connecting and spending time with them um, uh, to strengthen our bonds with our child on a regular basis? Your little thoughts on that, on, on building that connection with your child. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that connection is vital and so important because, um, well, as humans, we are made for relationship and our children are, are learning what healthy relationships look like and feel like by the relationship they have with us. And so it's helpful for me to think about what do I hope for for my child in their future relationships? What do I hope for in their marriage with whoever they choose to marry and their friendships? What do I want those relationships 
to be for them, to provide for them? What do I, how do I want them to be able to respond and, and, and um, relate in those relationships? And I think about that. Okay, well, I want them to be present and I want them to find joy in their relationships. I want them to have honesty and trust and um, authenticity. I want them to feel like they can be themselves in those relationships. Okay, so how do I model how to do that in our relationship? And that really requires time because relationship and connection develops with time. That's how we build trust. Um, that's how we build memories and you know those inside jokes and those traditions that we have. And all of those things create connection in the relationships which then allows us to have greater levels of trust and um, safety in those relationships, our ability to be honest and things like that. So finding out how your child um, loves is one way to do that. There are five love languages and um, we usually have primary one or two of them and that's how we as individuals receive love and give love. So those five love languages are quality time, spending time doing the thing that that person likes. So like my daughter, she really loves these, um, some of these kind of animal based reality shows. She loves them and she loves it when I sit down and watch them with her and ooh and ah over the dogs. I don't like them. I really don't like those shows, but she likes them. And so for her to get her tank filled up, her love tank filled up with quality time, which is her love language, I sit down and watch those shows with her because I know that's how she receives love. So it's quality time doing the thing that they like, not necessarily doing what we want to do. Okay, quality time, physical touch, hugs and kisses and snuggles, um, acts of service. So that's, you know, with my if my husband washed my car for me or um you know one day surprised me and and did the grocery shopping or something like that that would be acts of service or giving you know a back rub or something like that and then um, words of affirmation is another one giving compliments and words of praise and then the last one is gifts people you know even if it's just little gifts like a note in their lunchbox or a little note under their pillow or a little you know piece of candy um left somewhere for them or big gifts so that's those are the five the quality time the physical touch words of affirmation acts of service and gifts and so it can be helpful to figure out what is your child's love language what do they like best and how can you connect with them in that way and it's also important to know your own as well and that of your partner so spending time doing the things that really speak love to them um, and then playing games together, going outdoors together is a really, really important and helpful thing to do. Um, maybe creating traditions like every Sunday night we do a big family dinner and then we share about our week and we talk about what we hope will happen this week or something like that. Um, even to the little things of looking them in the eye, making sure that you're making eye contact with them every day. Before my kids get out of the car for um, school each day, I make sure that we make eye contact. I make sure to give them a, an I love you. This is a sign language for I love you. And then I verbally say it. And then we have a little mantra that we say, which is um, go shine your light in the world today, embrace mistakes and give yourself grace. And so we say that little mantra together each morning with the eye contact and the I love you. And that sends them off to school being very connected to me. And it takes all of, you know, 10 seconds at most. So there's little things that you can do to create that connection and, and let them know that you see them and you're there for them. And then there are the bigger things like the big traditions or spending weekends going out and exploring and things like that. And the things in the middle where you're playing board games or card games or watching shows together as a family. I think those little things are the things that that are really impactful, right? Like the eye contact. I mean, if you pay attention, a lot of people don't even make eye contact with their loved ones through the day. It's just kind of like I'm doing something and I'm talking to them over there. But the power of stopping, 
when somebody starts talking to you to stop what you're doing and turn toward them and make eye contact with them and let them know that you hear them with a nod or a, oh yeah or asking questions is so powerful and we don't do that enough anymore in our society where we are you know we're consumed with our devices or yeah I'm, I, yeah i'm listening yeah i'm listening as i'm doing this right looking down at that but stop what you're doing look at them let them know that you see them and that simple act creates that connection so powerful thank you so much Kira. I, I think like you said you know it's not our presence but our presence that's important right thank you so much for having me bye-bye